second invited talk of the evening. Um, so I welcome uh, Bart Brigatz from the, uh, I apologize for my terrible pronunciation, um, from the Free University of Brussels, uh, who is going to be giving us a talk on the, uh, yeah, on first order logic as a modeling system. Um, so take it away, Bart. Thanks a lot. Yeah, maybe uh, just to, to add a bit, uh, there are actually two free universities of Brussels. That's the wonder of, of Belgium, huh? uh, a French speaking and a Dutch speaking. And we're not allowed to sell ourselves as the free university of Brussels because then it's ambiguous. Huh? So the, the Vrije Universiteit Brussels, huh? to test uh, pronunciation a bit more. <laughs> no worries. Uh, but it's just, yeah, this is Belgium. Huh? Um, no, but so what I'll actually talk to you about today is uh, the IDP system. Um, some of you might have heard about it already, um, and I will try in this talk to, to, I will not go into details about all the, about the syntax and so on, I will try to mainly focus about some motivating principles behind it. So, so why are we doing certain things in a certain way, um, and what uh, uh, can be learned from it. And so, first of all, uh, let's start, uh, what is the IDP system, uh, so I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction, and then um, I'll, I'll talk about two major um, points uh, that motivated us in doing things a certain way. And this is a knowledge-based paradigm, and this is in section two, and about uh, informal semantics. I will say a bit about what we mean by informal semantics and about inductive definitions. So some introduction. Um, what is the IDP system? Well, it depends on who you ask often. Um, some might say, well, this is a some constraint programming system. Um, and in fact, uh, our, our underlying solver under IDP, Miniset ID, um, is a lazy class generation solver. Um, so you could well call that a constraint programming system. Um, some might say, well, it's an answer set solving system. And we've already had an invited talk on, on answer set solving. And indeed, there has been a long history of, of IDP participating in answer set competitions. Um, and actually, our inductive definitions, there, this kind of idea of closed world um, comes into play. Um, but I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. But some might even say it's a theorem prover because it's language, it's first order logic, it's first order logic is a deductive logic. And yes, you can use IDP for theorem proving. So our answer uh, would be, well, it's none or it's all of the above, but we describe IDP as a knowledge-based system. Now, of course, what do I mean by a knowledge-based system? Oh, by the way, anyone, please interrupt me at any point, okay? Um, I will not be monitoring the chat actively, but just, uh, Unmute yourself. Um, so um, uh, there are a couple of driving principles. I already highlighted them. The first is a knowledge-based paradigm. I'll start by explaining what that is. The second is a focus on a, a very clear and precise informal semantics. And what we mean by that um, in one sentence is that you should be able to translate formal expressions into natural language in such a way that it's super clear what they're supposed to mean. And the formal semantics should, of course, correspond uh, with the informal semantics. And also, our focus is in IDP is typically not on mm, super expert modelers, but rather on, let's say, naive users from the perspective of, of modeling, maybe, um, naive users that will not produce very, very good models. Um, what they will do is they, they might, for instance, not be aware of things like symmetry breaking. Huh? So what we then want to do is automated symmetry detection. For instance, I already mentioned IDP uh, it can be seen as a constraint uh, uh, programming system. And actually, you have the choice sometimes to use either a function in first order logic or a, a predicate uh, that represents that function. And depends on, depending on what kind of, of constraints you add over them, one representation might be better than the other. And so what we then want to do is, well, we want automated ways to detect that actually the, the, the theory the user uh, wrote uh, can be transformed and we automatically transform it into the better one. So we, we don't really assume that the user is making good models, but we try to optimize them. And we're willing to spend a lot of time prior to search in, in optimizing that model in some ways automatically so that, um, well, it's a bit closer to what an expert modeler might have produced. And so this is also um, one of the things we, we, um, well, we worked quite a lot on in the past. So the, the first thing, this, this knowledge-based paradigm, uh, um, this comes from the observation that if you look at the field of computational logic as a whole, different places in where logic is used to solve computational problem, there's 
one thing that really separates different domains, and this is the, the reasoning or the inference task. Um, for every reasoning task, some new logics are invented, or, or so, sometimes more than one. For instance, if you want to do deduction, ah, yeah, you, you use classical first order logic or restrictions of it, description logics. Um, if you want to do query answering, you go use a different language. Uh, for instance, you use SQL. Um, well, answer set computation has been covered before. If you want to do abduction, you, you have to uh, go to uh, abductive logic programming. If you want to solve constraint problems, you use one of the constraint languages. But all these languages are different. And, and often uh, the split between languages uh, or between classes of languages comes from uh, the type of problem you're actually tackling. It doesn't come from the type of knowledge you want to represent, but the type of problem you want to solve with that knowledge. And just to give a small example, Consider this proposition. Um, each lecturer teaches at least one course in the first bachelor. If I ask you, what kind of a proposition is it? What, what is its function? And since I'm talking to a, a constraint programming audience, uh, the first obvious answer would be, well, this is a constraint in some course assignment uh, problem. But I don't know if that is a constraint or not. It might be a query. It might be a query to a database. It, but uh, and in the database, there is some course assignment and it might be a query, uh, a Boolean query, is this true, yes or no, that each lecturer teaches at least one course. It might be a constraint in a course assignment problem, hmm? or it might also be something else. It might be some property that we wish to prove from a formal specification of course assignment. Hmm? So there's actually uh, this knowledge or this, this proposition in itself is independent of what you will use it for. And um, yeah, in practice, huh, what this would mean is that, well, we, you would have to represent it differently depending on what the type of task is that you're trying to solve. But of course, uh, uh, so I, I, I gave this claim already. It is declarative knowledge or, or this piece that is piece of information, this, this proposition, it's actually it's independent of the task. Huh? And, and you can see this because I was able to to give you the proposition without specifying the task. I could just read it out loud in natural language. And um, so if this knowledge is independent of the problem task, can we not uh, separate them on a formal level as well? And so in our view, a logical theory is, so a logical theory, that's uh, what uh, in CP terminology you would call a model. So this is, I will use model in two ways. Uh, in the logical sense of a structure being a model of a theory. And then in the CP sense, I will often try to, since I'm talking to a CP audience, to use model for theory. But um, if, I, if I sometimes use it another way, um, this is why. Huh? So uh, we typically use a logical um, terminology. So, OK, but so for us, a logical theory or a CP model huh, is just a bag of information. You cannot execute it. It's not a program and it doesn't represent a problem. Uh, none of these. Uh, and why is that? Uh, so why does it not even represent a problem? Because, well, actually it represents a lot of problems. You can use this knowledge to solve problems by applying some correct form of inference, depending on, on your problem at hand. Uh, for instance, if you do if you, um, the, the graph coloring problem, hmm, you can wonder what's the underlying knowledge. Well. No two vertices have the same color. Uh, we all know that. And you can represent this perfectly well in first order logic as follows. Uh, for all x, for all y, if there's an edge between x and y, then they have a different color. And this works perfectly well. But can you sol use first order logic to solve graph coloring problems? And, and what kind of inference do you need for this? That's a question that until not so long ago was not asked because first order logic was seen as a deductive logic. And deductive reasoning cannot be used for graph for solving this graph coloring problem. This is not a deductive problem. But on the other hand, what you could also say is, well, this is the knowledge. And there are other forms of reasoning that we can use with first order logic. And that will just solve the graph coloring problem. Namely, in our case, this would be what we call model expansion or model generation, given some finite set of uh, some finite domain or some, and an interpretation of some of the predicates compute um, an interpretation of the other predicates uh, or functions. And this is also what corresponds to uh, constraint programming. Now, 
Uh, and, and a question you can ask then is, well, if you have these multiple forms of reasoning that you could hypothetically do uh, with first order logic, would it not be nice that, that they're all integrated uh, in some way? And this is the idea of the knowledge-based paradigm. Uh, so I showed this already. A logical theory is not a representation of a problem, but you can solve problems with it by using the right form of inference. Very small example. Uh, uh, and this is that, that's really the idea of the knowledge-based system paradigm. Uh, the knowledge base might contain knowledge about valid course schedules. And you could use it for when you do model generation for computing a schedule. You could use it for checking the consistency of a schedule that someone created by hand. You could use it for revision tasks, for updating a schedule. But you could also use that same knowledge when you're doing deduction. For instance, suppose that there is some, somehow uh, there are suddenly new regulations, uh, fire safety regulations. And you might want to prove, and this is then deductive inference, that all the schedules that you will ever generate will indeed satisfy those fire safety regulations. So um, you can use the same knowledge for multiple uh, multiple types of reasoning, and that's what we what we implemented in in um, IDP. So uh, the IDP project, or the as we also sometimes call it, the Evo dot knowledge based system project. Um, the idea is this, uh, on, the, on the logical level, what we will do is we will study knowledge and we will develop expressive knowledge representation languages for, for this knowledge with a clear informal semantics. I come back to that uh, later. And we want an expressive language to be able to, to represent lots of different types of knowledge. And we, we will use a model theoretic semantics in the sense that we will the semantics will be based on some possible worlds, either being a model of a theory or not being a model of a theory. That is the, the, the Tarskian style model semantics. Um, we use first order logic as a foundation and we extend it where necessary. That's what we're doing on the logical level. And Evo.dot, uh, this, the name Evo.dot refers to a family of extensions of first order logic. I will say some more about the concrete extensions that we have in IDP later. Um, so on the application level, uh, what we're aiming there is well understanding in, in what are all the different understanding what are all the different ways in which knowledge is used to solve problems. Um, in some cases, you want to do some form of search constraint constraint solving, so model uh, generation. In other cases, you have deductive problems. In other in other cases, we we notice that certain forms of propagation inference are needed. Uh, for instance, when when you're interacting with a um, when, with, with interactive applications such as um, interactive configuration, and um, yeah, so what we want to get a, an overview of uh, what are the different ways that we use declarative specifications to solve problems. And so, on the inference level, uh, things we've been doing is building solvers for for different forms of inference. Sometimes. Um, integrating uh, with other uh, declarative uh, paradigms. Um, in IDP3, uh, the current version of the IDP system, everything is uh, glued together with the Lua scripting language. So if you want to combine multiple forms of inference, that's also possible. Uh, if you want to check, uh, do a deductive check and based on the outcome, do some model generation of one theory or another theory, that's all possible. Then a bit about the language, about um, Evo.dot, uh, so the family of extensions of first order logic, about informal semantics, and maybe about the, um, well, the most non-standard uh, extension, inductive definitions. And this also ties a bit to the, to the talk on ASP you've seen, and these inductive definitions, they're uh, um, at the core of ASP as well. Um, so first you might wonder, well, why would you use first order logic as a foundation? Uh, is, is this not the language that has failed in the 70s because it's undecidable because um, there's the expressivity efficiency trade off. So why would you use first order logic? Um, also, it's not suitable for describing some, some, some types of common sense knowledge. I like, and that's what the field of non-monotonic reasoning uh, grew out of observation. And some people say, well, it's too difficult. It's too difficult to use because quantifiers, we don't understand. It. So there's different reasons why you might not want to use first order logic. But on the other hand, uh, um, it is uh, an old system ca came out of uh, the, the laws of thought project in the, in the 18th and 19th century. It has some, a very limited set of connectives. And all of them have a very, very well understood um, semantics. So if I tell you uh, the definition of when 
n is uh, satisfied. Uh, so when, when a structure satisfies phi and psi, well, in natural language, that would just be, well, it satisfies phi and it satisfies psi. So these connectives, their, their informal semantics is very clear. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be careful with some of them. Uh, notably, implication is sometimes confusing to people. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they, they're, it's a simple, small set of connectives that's still quite powerful already. Um, and that, that seem to be, at least by mathematicians, very well understood. Uh, um, and if you ignore implication, actually, most people understand it quite well. Uh, sentences in first order logic, um, well, most people. Um, People who are willing to do some declarative modeling well, are often um, often understand it quite well. And so I mentioned this already. It has a very clear informal semantics. If I give you a, a formula in first order logic, it's quite easy to translate it into a natural language sentence automatically, such that someone who is given the natural language sentence really has the would accept the, the right set of worlds as models uh, or, or non-models, would be able to really understand what does this sentence actually say. I have a question um, for you here. Yes, of course. Just in the previous slide, you said that it's too difficult to use, but now yeah, well, I feel like you're, you're saying the opposite. That's a, a, a that's criticism. Opinion. That's a criticism that, that sometimes said, yes. Um, well, I would say I, I disagree uh, mostly with, it's, it's too with being too difficult to use. Um, if you try to use it in the right way, huh? if you if you go write arbitrary first order formulas, it's sometimes quite hard to understand. But there's often quite some structure in there. For instance, quantifiers are difficult to understand. Yeah, but actually, the way quantifiers occur in natural language are is not just in arbitrary ways. Huh? Actually, there's often uh, things in natural language states. All humans are men or women. Hmm? You you never have have any statement on the form all objects in the world are said so if they're human, then they're men or women. And that's what's actually the, 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 the FO sentence is saying here, right? Actually, the statements we make are often binary quantifications in the sense that all things of a certain set uh, satisfy a certain property. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is also one of the reasons why um, in, in, in some versions of IDP, we now have these binary quantifications already that you say, well, you don't have to, you don't have to quantify over the entire domain. Uh, that's the difficult thing with quantifiers. You don't have to quantify over the entire domain, but you can quantify over a subset, for instance, over some type. And, and um, that's why we use a type logic. So there are difficulties in using it, but on the other hand, um, it's also at the informal semantics. So it, we can, it's, it's super clear in the sense that um, you don't need the original first order statement to know precisely if you translate it to natural language, to know precisely what it said. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us something about, you said that also this is a language that failed in the past. Mm -hmm. So why, what's your argument here? Like, so you said okay. it's difficult, but maybe it's not so difficult, but then no. why did it fail for practice? Um, actually, um, mm, okay, so I have this on a, on a, I'll come back to this in, in three slides or something like that, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and just so, before um, we continue, there's some interesting points in the chat, which just maybe would be interesting. So, so one of them was commenting that the sentence, the human, not all humans are explicitly a man or a woman. So it could be that we have other, other genders to... So I'm not saying whether the sentence is true or not. Huh? Yeah. I, I'm just saying yeah. what the sentence means. Um, yeah, yeah, but just maybe we should update our, our uh, sentences. Huh? But so this is just, uh, um, this might be a true or false statement in the real world. Uh, mm -hmm. First order logic doesn't say anything about that, of course. Yeah, and, and I think Guido makes a really interesting comment that's saying that people usually when they say or, they, they, don't, they mean um, exclusive or, so not both, for example. But first order um, logic Yes, and that's exactly uh, in, the, in the translation to natural language. If we translate a, a formula into natural language, uh, say um, P or Q would be translated into P holds or Q holds or both in the natural language translation. So if you if we say, what is the meaning of or in logic, it would be the first or the second or both in natural language. And then it's super clear. Uh, and so then if you say that in natural language, so the idea is you can translate these statements in such a way that they really convey all of the meaning. Mm -hmm. And that's important if you want to have a, a knowledge representation language that people really understand. Okay, 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 thanks. 
So, um, so yeah, so a couple of claims. Huh? So actually most um, languages that, that for declarative modeling, they somehow have some overlap with first order logic. It's often hidden. Uh, in many of the languages, the, the, because of syntactic differences, the, um, the overlap is hidden, but there's, there's often a substantial overlap. Um, so things like um, loops in constraint programming, they're very close to, um, to uh, for all quantifiers in logic. Um, answer set programming has logical foundations. Yeah, SQL is built on first order logic. There's, there's a lot of overlap there. And something else that we noticed as well, for many things, it's just not enough. It's just not rich enough. If you want to express things like um, aggregates, you cannot do it in first order logic. Definitions, inductive definitions, you cannot do it. So we need to extend it. Yeah. And so about the reason why it failed, uh, the, the, what you asked about before um, is, um, so deductive reasoning for in first order logic is undecidable. That's a huge problem. Uh, people, people often use it as an argument for, for why first order logic is not really usable for computational purposes. But much, many, many logics that are much richer exist and, and they're actually in use. The thing is just, we're not using them for deductive inference. So um, the failure of, of first order logic in, in the, uh, say in, in the seventies um, actually was mainly a failure of doing everything with purely deductive reasoning for first order logic. But if we now view first order logic as just some language in which you can represent knowledge and you have multiple forms of inference to use on it, then this might well become perfectly usable. Um, so we will just, so our, our, our take on this is, well, undecidability of deductive inference, sure, let's just live with it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this means that we will not be able to solve this completely, but other forms of inference might very well be usable. Let's focus on the knowledge. Let's focus on representing the knowledge as well as possible in the hope to solve a lot of interesting problems with it. Um, so what we do concretely in IDP, uh, so the observation that first order logic is not rich enough in a certain sense, we extend it with, with types, uh, a type logic. Uh, this doesn't really extend the expressivity. You could do everything with, with unary predicates. Uh, but this really extends the usability of the of the um, the logic from knowledge representation point of view. We extend it with inductive definitions, and that's maybe the most let's say non-standard extension. Um, it's also the ID is what at some point um, the name of uh, IDP meant. It, it was first called inductive definition programming, but then it is shifted to. Uh, imperative declarative programming, which, which refers to the way that we combine uh, um, different specifications um, with an imperative interface uh, with, with the Lua language. We extend it with aggregates. I will illustrate all of these things on a small example um, soon, because I see uh, time is running out already. Um, we extend it with some, some arithmetic. Um, and in the future, uh, these are a couple of extensions that are on our radar. Uh, uh, what we would like to do is uh, to in integrate co-inductive definitions as well, modal operators, higher order logic. So we're, we're really focusing on extending the language. Yeah? But these first four are currently uh, in the system already. Um, and so what we study is also ways in which all these different language constructs can live together in a, in a single logic. And so how, how do they interact? Uh, that's an important line of research. Um, so I will say a bit more about inductive definitions. I think most people in the audience have used them already, inductive definitions. We write them in mathematical papers. And there are actually two main sorts of uh, inductive definitions. Uh, some are monotonic, monotonic inductive definitions, like the transitive closure of a graph. Uh, and this is the, the, the kind of definition you could see in a, in a, in a paper or in a, in a handbook. Um, and, and some are inductions over some well-founded order, for instance, the satisfaction relation in propositional logic is defined on the structure of the formula. And it's a some well-founded order on which this uh, induction is defined. And what we see is then there might be um, negation in the body of, a, of such a rule. Uh, this definitions take the form of rules. Uh, this holds in case, um, uh, so um, a structure uh, models Q if Q is just in the structure. If it's an atom, it models a conjunction if it models both. And negation if it does not model um, 
a alpha itself. And so what we know is uh, from Tarski's principle, there are basically two ways of characterizing these uh, definitions constructively, uh, some set obtained by rule application and non-constructively as uh, the least set colors on the rule application. And well, we know that these principles coincide, um, but they do not. Um, so this only works in the monotonic case. Uh, this is, um, yeah, you, you can check it. I will not go into details here or we can uh, um, talk about it in the questions. Uh, but so they, they only coincide in the monotonic case and definitions, they're super clear. Uh, if you write them in papers, they have to be clear. Otherwise your paper will, will get rejected. They're very precise. They're intuitively, everyone understands them, but scientifically um, some uh, understanding is or, or was uh, until recently still missing. Mm -hmm. And um, also you cannot do, um, you cannot express inductive definitions in first order logic. For instance, transitive closure, it's impossible. The compactness theorem shows it. So if we, if we want them, if we want this, this very clear way of writing knowledge that we use in papers. If we want to have it in a knowledge representation language, we should we should put it uh, oh, in a vow, let's say, we should extend the vow with it because we cannot just do it. Uh, so, um, so what a theory, uh, an FOID theory, first order logic with inductive definitions is, it consists of first order sentences and definitions, sets of rules. Um, for instance, this could be an FOID theory and could someone um, can someone take a guess about what it says, this theory? So the first part uh, in between the brackets is a definition. And the second part is just a standard first order sentence. It's reachability. It's reachability. So the first part is uh, the, reach, the reachability definition, definition uh, relation is defined as follows. Uh, everything in the graph uh, is in the uh, the transitive closure basically uh, and 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 then the second the recursive the recursive uh, rule is the second one but then there's also this first order constraint yeah so it's saying connectedness yes indeed and and so these definitions and this first order constraint they live together very well and so this is saying well r is the reachability uh, graph of g and g is a connected graph huh? or uh, it says uh, for every X or every Y, uh, X, Y must be in R. Uh, so um, what you see is a, a definition just um, gives us a relation between R and G in this case. Uh, and this constraint is just the kind of constraint that you would expect. Um, it says, well, R is the, the total relation basically. Um, and we have this claim, uh, there's a KR 2014 paper. It, an extension is also um, on the way. Um, that says, well, actually, if you take a bunch of rules under well-founded semantics, all the kind of inductive definitions that you find in text fall under, uh, are captured well with the well-founded semantics, meaning um, the well-founded model will be nicely two-valued and will, will do exactly what we think, um, what the original definition um, defines. I will, will define the relations the correct way. So, um, Basically, uh, so what we have in FOID is that we have two types of implications or, well, connectives that look like arrows. Huh? We have on the one hand material implication, just standard first order logic. And on the other hand, we have definitional rules. And these rules, they're as if you would write, the relation is defined inductively as follows, colon, and then you, you go enumerate your rules. Uh, that's the way you write this in a mathematical text. That's what our rules mean. Um, and I will just, um, in the interest of time, quickly switch to my demo. Uh, I will have to stop the share here for a second um, because I have to share this here. So I will just demonstrate a couple of the language features in IDP. Um, is this here? So this is, um, I hope you can read this. This should be big enough, I guess. Um, this is the IDP uh, web interface. So what we have, first of all, we have a logical vocabulary, which is just the type of thing that you expect uh, in, in standard uh, logical things. In this case, we're modeling some, some temporal system. I will skip over the uh, time and so on. And we have some objects and we have a specific object table. What we're modeling is a robot that can move blocks. Uh, it's a blocks world. The robot can, can take a block, put it on another block. And the thing here is it can take an entire stack of blocks at once and move it. But if it takes too many blocks at once, they fall. Yeah. Um, 
And so at any point in time, objects, and these are blocks or the table, can be on other objects. And the robot can have one block in his, in his or one object in his hand. And he has two actions, taking an object or putting the one he has down. And there is some, uh, so this is a predicate over time and objects, uh, the way you expect, I think. And there are some, what we call derived fluence, like above. Sometimes we want to know if one block is above another one, somewhere above it. Hmm? Um, and some, we also want to know sometimes, well, if he takes this block, does it fall yes or no? Um, and in a the logical theory, what we see here is, well, you see here the aggregates coming in. Huh? This, this sentence is saying for every time, the number of blocks that he takes plus the number of basically putting down actions he does can be at most two, because a robot can only do one action at a time. There's some other constraints saying, well, if you, if you uh, put a block down, then you must have be holding it. If, if you want to do the action put down, then you must be holding it. You can only put a block down that you're holding, and so on. Standard type of constraints. And here you see an inductive definition. The relation above, this is just basically transitive closure in this case for every time point. So a block is above another one, is if it's directly on top of it or uh, the standard recursive rule. And so this is a definition and well-founded semantics will give you exactly uh, the transitive closure of on. And then you've got um, another definition of, well, now when does a robot hold a block? Well, when he takes it or if he had it in the previous time point and doesn't put it down. Um, what I wanted to show with this temporal thing here is, well, you can do different forms of inference with it. Um, and they're glued together here with some Lua procedure. What you see is, well, here we're computing some model, some arbitrary well, solution, uh, some arbitrary structure that satisfies the theory that expands some input some on a finite domain. But you can use the same theory to, for instance, as done here, to prove invariance about the theory. Yeah? It, and this can be either done in the context of a given finite domain, which is done here, or it can be done without even a finite domain. You can just prove this invariance. You, and you basically what we do is we translate uh, the, the claims um, to the um, TPTP language and we call a theorem prover. So we didn't implement any theorem provers ourselves. Um, you can manipulate theories and structures uh, in this Lua interface. For instance, what's done here is you say, well, this T that was specifying how our, the world be, um, evolves over time, we merge it with some other theory that specifies a goal. And this goal here was, um, the goal is here. There exists some time point in which all the blocks are on the table. The way the robot can achieve this is by taking the lowest block and, and well, in this specific example, and just making the entire stack fall. Um, and so we've got this interface to well, glue together different forms of inference. And um, mm, this here even allows you to interactively walk through different time points. Um, but I will not go too deep because I see that I'm running out of time. So to go back to my slides. Um, there, okay, so we did this demo. Um, so, very briefly, what's next for IDP? Um, so actually IDP3, the one I demonstrated now, is no longer uh, maintained. No one is really working on it anymore. And there's a new version coming in which we built on, on Microsoft C3 Solver uh, for doing a lot of the hard work. And we're also replacing our Lua interface by a Python interface um, because of uh, well everyone being more used to programming in Python than in Lua. Um, and actually, with the, with the new version that's coming, there will be a strong focus on allowing extensions of the language. So we're, we're really working on that for it to be a playground for rich knowledge representation languages. Um, the focus will be less strong in the new version on, on efficiency. Um, and yeah, so if you want to read a bit more about this, um, of course, there's a, a, our IDP paper. Um, the idea of the knowledge-based system paradigm is best uh, you, you follow this uh, trajectory. If you want to know about definitions, why they're important. And I think yeah, if the question is, if there's one or two things that we should take away from IDP, because I heard you ask that question in previous uh, um, presentations, I would say on the one hand, well, inductive definitions are, are a nice concept. Uh, so having some uh, 
general constraint saying this relation is a transitive closure of this one, or some richer form of inductive definitions would be very nice. And, and the other thing is the idea that if you have these logical foundations, you can do much more with your um, CP model huh, than, than um, just CP solving. I think that might also be a valid takeaway uh, in the sense that you could prove properties about your about your model that you then know that all solutions will satisfy. Um, but for that, you need this, these logical foundations, I would say. Um, so if there are any questions, um, I would be very happy to answer them. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so I think we have a hand up. Uh, my window is not quite wide enough to see. Uh, Gottfried. Uh, okay. Hi. Great presentation. I have a uh, uh, couple of questions. Uh, when is the new version coming out? Do you expect the new version? To come um, that's a, a good question. Mm. So it's it can already be tried online, but when I don't I don't really have an idea of when there will be a real uh, okay. let's say okay. a stable a stable um, and, version and of it. And sorry, a, a very specific question because mm -hmm. I saw that you had alloy on one of the slides. Uh, what what would you say? Because I was always very fond of 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 the alloy language, but I never just from the conception, but what would you say would be the uh, advantage of using the IDP in contrast to alloy? So, mm. but how do they relate to each other? Because there is also some relational logic and transitive closure, but in this time it's it's mapped to as a set uh, constraint solver and yeah. Um. So, yeah, so our solver is also um, um, basically a set based solver. Huh? Um, I called it the lazy class generation solver before. Uh, so, in Alloy, I think um, some of the nice things are like um, symmetry is super obvious there. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think this this view of a logical theory being more than just the representation of a single problem. I think that's what what really sets IDP apart from most um, other formalisms out there. Um, so I don't remember the exact features, but I, I I thought that there were also some higher order features in Alloy that are super nice. Um, so yeah, language wise, I think. There's no, um, yeah, the inductive definitions are also maybe a, 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 like a, a unique selling point of IDP. Um, mm, well, they also have them in, in ASP, but um, okay. they don't okay. call them inductive definitions. That's, thanks, yeah. thanks, great. Um, so in the chat window, we have uh, Leonard who is asking for a link to IDP. Um, so do you have that on a slide somewhere? Or? Um, I will just uh, paste it in the chat uh, window as well. And then uh, in the link I paste, you can click on uh, online IDE um, if you want to try it just online, if you don't want to download it. So the, the interface I just showed you. Um, there is also some examples if you click on files so that you can load some examples. Excellent. And it looks like Peter has a question. Yeah, just, I mean, I appreciate the idea behind IDP and I like the idea, but the the more general the language, the harder it is to map it down to something that can be sold efficiently. So for example, mm -hmm. I don't know how your uh, blocks world model would solve compared to uh, a fast forward, a fast downwards planner running on a PDL definition of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So is that that we should, as like modeling language writers, that's our job to make those translations as efficient as possible? Or should we pollute the language with more specialized features to, um, to not have to do so much work? Um, so it's actually, mm, so 
uh, the 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 more expressive you make your language, the harder it will be to solve things efficiently. In a certain sense, yes, but in another sense, this is also not really true. In the sense that, well, in a very expressive language, there might be ways that you can express something that just make it much easier to solve it because now suddenly the solver can see the structure. Um, and and um, well, an example is is um, if you make a set model of something, super restricted language, uh, we, we just do it all in Boolean satisfiability, yeah, uh, all symmetries are lost, or at least, well, they're still in the theory, but the solver cannot just see them anymore. While if you have some, some first order language where you just have some domains and the solver can see, well, everything is interchangeable, yeah, uh, inference suddenly becomes much, much uh, more efficient. Yeah? Um, take for instance, yeah, solving I agree. I so, agree that it's not necessarily the case that the higher mm -hmm. level language, the less efficient, but but somehow the more expressive the language, the more kinds of things you have to map down to a solver in mm -hmm. an efficient way. So you are making your life more difficult, right? Yes, yes, that's true. Um, so, um, and actually in, in, in applications we've recently worked on, we've often worked in applications that it's quite small domains and in the sense that then efficiency is no longer really a bottleneck, but there, were, there was just a lot of knowledge. And for instance, configuration problems, um, there's just a lot of knowledge of going on uh, that, that you want to express, but the, the underlying problems are not that difficult. Uh, so are not that large. And in that case, well, it doesn't matter that you make your life more difficult. So, um, yeah, I, I would say there's no like real correct answer, correct way to go. Um, we, we tend to focus on, on rich languages, on, on making the life of the modeler um, easy yeah, on the, while, yeah, this is at the cost of either, yeah, efficiency or lots of work to do in order to, to make it efficient in general. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, before uh, handing over to Amir, I'm gonna ask a question of my own. Um, so you have all these different kind of styles of queries you can answer from the same knowledge base. How much of the sort of machinery of processing that knowledge base do you get to reuse between like solving a planning problem versus solving a like satisfiability problem versus uh, you know verification? Um, so I would say, uh, quite a lot, uh, many types of the, many of these types of inference are actually, um, can actually be translated into one another. For instance, if you talk about planning and about satisfiability, well, we, we will not do anything dedicated for planning. We will just use, well, satisfiability solving, finding a model or, or optimization, uh, to, to solve this kind of a, a planning problem. Um, of course, if you go towards um, theory improving and so on, yeah, internally, I mean, our data structures are the same, theories are represented the same, but we just translate them out to some existing language that can be accepted by theorem provers and we let them, we let them deal with it. So in that sense, what we try to do in IDP is basically integrating these different ways that are known uh, to solve um, problems with first order logic. And, and we don't try to do everything ourselves because it would just be way too much work. Um, thanks. Yes, Amir, did you still have uh, your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just have a, have a question. Yeah, so thanks for the talk. And thanks for also answering my, my question before I asked it, like what can we take away from the IDP? And I would just like to follow up briefly on what you said there. So what I found interesting is that you have this claim where you can prove some properties about your model, like that are not necessarily about finding a solution, but just give you prove some property. And I think this is, it could be very insightful just based on the, the, the definition of the problem, you can get more insight into the problem. And maybe even you can use this to reformulate your problem for another system so that maybe the solving is, is better, for example, like maybe it's symmetry, maybe it's some connection that we didn't see, but it's there. And I'll be just interested to hear, do you have any idea, like, do you do this? automatically like how do you can we automatically extract these interesting properties that we could possibly use in another system um maybe to improve the, the the model in some way so do you mean whether we um generate the the um 
the property itself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. is, so, there not, is there a way to generate interesting properties that are not uh, obvious maybe to... Actually, uh, yeah, uh, for instance, um, the function detection we do. Um, so what we do is... Um, mm, Okay, so if you have a, a function, say from, from some finite domain to some finite domain, and maybe it's a, some integers, and um, that function um, is, um, what we would do with that function is it would become an array of constraint variables in our translation, and then um, we would have some, uh, some constraint solver running on it if we want to do model expansion with um, mm, mm, some bounds encoding. Um, an, uh, a lazy class generation solver doing some bounce encoding of these integer variables. However, yeah, if the user accidentally didn't express this as a function on which he applies some, some um, constraint, but as a predicate, which would be perfectly valid in, in our theory, then we automatically detect, well, actually this predicate that you have, of which you somehow implicitly specified that it's actually a function, but you didn't call it a function, you called it a predicate, that we indeed see, yeah, this is indeed a function. And then we we get this property, this kind of detection we do automatically. We search for what, for the different predicates of which one are functional constraints entailed. And there we use this, this entailment check. Uh, so this is independent of a concrete instance. Huh? This is just uh, mm -hmm. with only the uh, yeah. CP model, huh? to the theory. Um, so that's one of the things that we do automatically. But mostly this kind of verification properties, we, we um, we provide the infrastructure for if you propose one to check whether it's indeed, indeed entailed or not. Uh, but we don't go, typically we don't go generate them, but in this case we do. What about the symmetries? Like symmetry detection, would this fit into this kind of proving of properties framework? Mm, not really, uh, mm -hmm. because the symmetries, well, we do detect them based on the theory. But still, it might be that if you give a concrete structure in which certain predicates are already given a value, that that, that, that breaks the symmetry. Mm -hmm. So um, the detection happens on the first order theory, but then there's still a check need. Are, they, are these elements indeed still interchangeable in mm -hmm. the structure you're giving? So it's mm -hmm. a combination of the two there. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, that's not a, um, well, we, we basically do a syntactic check there. So we don't use the theorem provers to prove that something is a symmetry. This is basically just a syntactic check. If you, if you don't mention any object specifically in your theory, then two objects in the same type are interchangeable. So that's, um, yeah. So it's simpler in a certain sense than the function detection. So now here's right. just like a final quick one. Oh, sorry, since okay. nobody's asking questions, I'll just ask one more. Is that, would you argue that this is really uh, for the naive user? Like, can you, how can you argue that this is easier, for example, for them to, to work with, for instance? Um, I could see like why it could be easier, but then I could also see why it could be more difficult to write in first order, like order logic. Yes, so in our, so in, in the experience we've had, people more familiar with, Computer science will typically find it more confusing uh, compared to say, say constraint programming languages uh, that we have these this, um, quantifiers instead of just writing some loops. Huh? Um, but on the other hand, people coming more from the, from the business side that we, we talked with, they uh, were often not really able to, to write down specifically the right, the right constraints in first order logic. Huh? But once they're there and that we say, well, this is how you translate them to natural language. This is just the principle of how you translate a vote to natural language. They were able to understand everything and say, okay, yeah, that's correct. And this one, no, this one seems not correct. That's not what we have in our, in our decision process. This doesn't fit in there. So they are able to, to figure out uh, um, the correct ones from the incorrect ones. But going back, I say from natural language to logic, that was often, well, for them too difficult. So that's, um, yeah where we stand, I would say. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. All right, I think we still have a, a little while before the uh, schedule for the next talk. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I mean, otherwise, I think we can probably, 
actually get started with the next set of talks a little bit early. Um, oh, 